Do you recognize these roads? They're the rocket to school, to the movies, the Y, the PTA, or wherever. They look a little different, maybe, but they're the same roads, with the same kinds of cars, the same kinds of people, driving in the same kinds of ways. A fellow coming along right now, maybe you'll recognize. Name is Arthur. Arthur Average. But don't let the name mislead you. Arthur Average is nothing like you. He couldn't be. His driving isn't always perfect. A thing like this, for example, would never happen to you. You never went through the agony of cutting back your speed so it wouldn't be noticed. You surely never wore this look of studied purity. And you certainly wouldn't go native as soon as the eye of the law left you to your own conscience and good sense. Or would you? Would I? Let's just talk about Arthur. You've probably never been to the place Arthur is now going. And Arthur wouldn't be here either if there were any semblance of justice and decency left in the world. Ask him. Ask anybody in the whole courtroom, you'll get the same answer. Four gathered each morning within these walls is the most oppressed, abused, unfairly accused group of people in all human experience. Each one the innocent victim of a shocking miscarriage of justice, arrested while traveling 20 miles an hour with the signal hand outstretched a hundred yards ahead of a full boulevard stop by a wise guy cop who had to fill his quota of tickets. Also, he was very rude. Now I'd like to have you and Arthur meet a selected cross-section of these oppressed victims. You might see if you can figure out what kind of driver each one is. This is Mr. Bangs, lawyer. Mrs. Hackaberry, housewife. Mr. Bender, salesman. Mr. Whipple, chief clerk. Mr. Noyes, student. And Miss Flippin, uh, conversationalist. Now, Arthur, you already know. Please rise. Face the flag of our country, recognizing the principles for which it stands. Division 29 of the Municipal Court is now in session. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, before each session of this court, I take a few minutes to discuss with you the traffic problem, a problem that concerns each and every one of us. It's not a police problem. It's not a city problem. It's yours. It's our problem. Last year in America, there was over $1 billion worth of property damage caused by automobile accidents. Is it any wonder that the insurance rates on our cars keep mounting each year? But that is only money. If I were to tell you that yesterday the entire population of St. Louis, Missouri, every man, woman, and child therein had either been killed or seriously injured by some calamity, earthquake or atomic bomb, you'd think that was a national calamity of the first magnitude. And so it would be. It would be on the front pages of every newspaper in the world. Yet last year in the United States, there were over one million people who were either killed, maimed for life, or seriously injured by automobiles. Automobiles driven by people like you and me. There is one person killed in the United States by automobiles every 15 minutes, and one person injured every 26 seconds. And if you happen to be a parent and have two children, as most of us do, we can all make up our minds to one thing right now. 
that one of those children will either be killed or seriously injured by an automobile. That is, if we keep on driving the way we have in the past. The tragedy of traffic deaths is that they are largely preventable. There is no such thing as an accident. These are not acts of God. They are acts of men and could have been avoided. Don't call them accidents. Now, I have a lot of people who step up here every day and tell me that they haven't had a traffic ticket for 8, 10, or even 15 years. Well, we all know what we're talking about when we make those kind of brash assertions, don't we? What we're really saying is that we haven't been caught in 8, 10, or 15 years. A short time ago, our metropolitan newspapers carried a tragic picture. It showed a clergyman on the corner of one of our busy intersections giving a young woman the last rites. And how did that young woman happen to be on that corner? Why, all the young fellow she was riding with did was just run a red light. But this time, when the young fellow ran the red light, another fellow, a sort of eager beaver chap, jumped his signal. And the two cars met out in the middle of the intersection with a resounding crash. They dragged the young woman out of the twisted wreckage. And she died a few minutes later on the sidewalk. And the young man died on the way to the receiving hospital. I'm going to get a copy of that photograph, have it enlarged and place it here in this courtroom so that everyone can see it, including myself. And I'm going to put this title on it. He only ran the red light. We will now proceed with the calendar. In the first row, rise. Please come forward and take the chairs in front of the railing. Call the first case. Walter F. Simpson. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty from Mr. Simpson. Because of these two prior violations, I'll have to fine you $30. And I don't know anywhere in this town that you can get less for your hard-earned money. That's all, Mr. Simpson. Mary T. Howland. Guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Well, don't be nervous, Miss Howland. We just want to get things squared away. Have you had your license renewed since this ticket was written? There'll be no fine in that case, Miss Holland. Matthew W. Watts. Guilty or not guilty? And so it goes, until we're down to the last of the defendants who have waited to make statements. A Mr. Dover is pleading his case at the moment. Yes, I know that intersection, Mr. Dover. When a bus is taking on passengers, it's very possible that the stop sign is obscured. I'll accept your story. Fine will be suspended. Mr. Bangs, I'll hear your statement now. While the judge is hearing about what Mr. Bangs is innocent of, I might point out that Arthur and his six companions happen to represent the seven deadly sins of automobile driving. Each exhibits one of the basic mental attitudes about driving which causes a lot of the traffic problems. Which attitude is Mr. Bangs? Well, the judge listens to a couple of dozen Bangses every session. And while he's too polite to say anything about it out loud, he must do some very candid thinking. Yes, Mr. Bangs, I'm listening. I wish I weren't. I wish that the ethics of the bench would let me say right out in court what I really think of your kind of driving. I wonder if you really expect me to believe this story of yours. As you started to head slowly and carefully, this woman dashed right out in front of your car. Despite your patient action, the officer was coarse and abusive. The only trouble with the officer was he used the wrong name on your ticket. You, Mr. Bangs, are a grabber. At home, in your office, 
You may be an honest and even generous man, but in an automobile, you're greedy and selfish. You're a chiseler. You will grab away the rights of other people any time you can steal a couple of seconds for yourself. I only wish you could realize how the other drivers feel about you. It might make you feel pretty small. I'm sorry, Mr. Bangs. I cannot accept your explanation. The fine will be $15. Mrs. Hackerberry, please. Mrs. Nellie Hackerberry to the bench. I don't see so many of your kind, Mrs. Hackerberry. Usually you cause other drivers to crash or get arrested. Now let's see what's this you're so indignant about. I suppose it never occurred to you that you ought to learn how to start your car on an upgrade before you go steering a ton of dangerous machinery around on a public highway. A lot of proud males will call you a woman driver. But they're wrong. Because for every nervous Nellie on the road, there's a nervous Nelson who drives the same way. You just don't seem to realize that when you creep along the highway, particularly straddling the lanes or otherwise blocking the flow of traffic, you're actually forcing other drivers into danger. And I wish you'd remember to give a hand signal before you pull across a lane or lurch out on one of those sudden inspiration swoops you seem to favor. Think before you do something. Think ahead of your car. Calling Mr. Bender. Mr. Bender to the bench. I'll listen to you, Mr. Ben, but you know why you're really here. Drinking. Oh, not much. Just a quick one with the boys after work or one more for the road. Yes, I know. You honestly think that a drink or two actually improves your driving, sharpens you up, makes you smarter, faster. Well, I have news for you. It actually delays your reactions. It messes up your judgment of speed and distance. The ticket doesn't list you as a drunk driver. Well, technically, you weren't drunk. You were just a bit above yourself. You light drinkers are just as dangerous on the road as the out-and-out -out drunk. You feel very important. You're nine feet tall and you can drive better than anybody. Well, if you keep on being lucky, the other drivers may keep on saving your life. Mr. Whipple, please. Mr. Whipple to the bench. Ah, yes, the innocent Mr. Whipple. You look so harmless. The graver is nasty by nature, but you've had to work at it. You're a mousy little fellow, really. But when your hand touches the steering wheel, you swell up like a hop toad. Yes, I know. This is a public street, and who the heck does he think he is? I'll tell you who he is. He's your brother under the hood. He's another super mouse. The really big man doesn't have to look big. He doesn't have to be the front man in a line of cars. He doesn't have to show his power by blocking people off. He doesn't have to make himself feel right by putting other people in the wrong. Miss Flippin, please. Miss Daisy Flippin, statement. Some other time, Miss Flippin, I'd be most happy to hear about your brother's, cousin's, employer's idea about the, the injustice of this traffic ticket. But now there's many other people waiting to be heard. In fact, Miss Daisy Flippin, you never realize there are other people to be considered. And that's why you're here. 
You're not greedy. You're not nervous. You're not even insane. Although you certainly give that impression to other drivers. You just won't think two seconds ahead of your very pretty nose. And you skitter around on crowded streets as though you were all alone on a desert island. Looking for an address, Miss Flippin? A mortuary, perhaps. Okay, do your looking from a standstill. And do see if you can't concentrate a little more on what you're supposed to be doing, namely, driving. Mr. Noyes next, Mr. A. Noyes. Ah, yes, one of our regular customers. Hot Shot Noise, the infant speed boy. Well, maybe I was a little the same at your age. I thought I was cutting such a dashing, romantic figure. And all the time, people were laughing at me. Your kind of driving is kid stuff. Worse, it's incompetent. You're erratic, fast and slow. You can't seem to hold the steady, even pace that marks the really good driving. Good driving is smooth driving. And until you catch on to that, you'll just be a kid trying to look like long pants. This flashy stuff went out with your cowboy suit noise. It's a holdover from childhood to ask for trouble and not expect to get it. I guess you're going to grow up after all. I'm sorry I can't say the same for your friend. All your life, you're going to hate yourself for killing him just because you had to look like a hotshot. How did you feel when you faced his father and mother? Will you ever forget the smell of the flowers at his funeral? You showed off, Noise. And for what? Arthur Average. Is Arthur Average here? you have here, Mr. Average. I'll be very interested to hear anything you can think of to say about it. The same old double talk. Actually, this Arthur Average isn't a bad fellow. He's only what his name implies, an average driver. And he's headed for an average accident. Being average, he's not as extreme as the grabber and the others, but he shows the traits of all of them. The root of his trouble is he's impatient. He just can't seem to relax and enjoy his driving. Like Desert Island Daisy, he'll let his mind wander until a sudden emergency catches him short by that fatal tenth of a second. Like the grabber, he'll put people to inconvenience, maybe danger, to chisel a petty little game. Like Super Mouse, he has a tendency to go out of his way to put other drivers in the wrong. Or like Two Beers Benny, he follows too closely on the cars ahead and sometimes he makes a coupe out of the other fellow's sedan. And he constantly wonders why the police let all these idiot drivers clutter up the highway. Isn't there any way to wake him up? That will cost you $50, Mr. Average, and you're lucky not to be going to jail. What's your occupation? I, uh, I'm a salesman, Your Honor. Uh, I work on a straight commission basis. I can't afford a fine like that. Approach the bench, please. There's a lot of other things that you can't afford either. The first is the loss of your driver's license. 
so that you can't drive to your daily work. And that's what's going to happen to you the next time you come in here. But you can afford that a lot better than to lie on your back in the hospital for a month. Are you a married man? Yes, sir. Any children? Yes, sir. Little girl three years old and a baby boy three days and six hours. Well, congratulations. I suppose you have great plans for him. Oh, yes, sir. I think it was break right. I never got to college myself, but believe me, Your Honor, he will. Yes, he will, unless you kill yourself before then. You can't afford a $50 fine. You can't afford to lose your driver's license. And you can't afford to lie on your back in a hospital. And yet you can afford all of those things better than to leave your wife, the little girl, and that cute baby boy to live out the years ahead, maybe poor, and perhaps a little hungry now and then. And all because you had to drive like a bully instead of a civilized member of this community. Well, you can pay the fine in $10 installments. That's all, Mr. Average, except that when you get over being mad at me, just think over what we've been talking about here today. Yes. Does that complete the calendar? Yes, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, for you are ladies and gentlemen, we're all ladies and gentlemen, except when we're behind our steering wheels. I hope your experience in this court today has made you realize what unsafe driving costs. But I want you to go out of this courtroom with a much more important realization. The realization that safe driving pays. Proof is in sight every day you drive. For example, trucks roll millions of miles a month over crowded highways. Yet truck drivers are involved in far less than their per mile share of injuries and deaths. This safety is no accident. These drivers are picked men, trained and skilled. Driving is their profession. They can't afford delays. Accidents cause delays, so they don't have accidents. Why? You ask a dozen drivers and you'll get a dozen answers, but they all boil down to one key word, courtesy, golden rule driving. Is this because they're softies or scared of trouble? Not these gentlemen. They're trained to help motorists in trouble on the highway. Why? Why, because they and their employers have found out by long experience that courtesy pays. Courtesy saves your money. It saves your nerves. It may save your life. And it will give you an entirely unexpected bonus. You may not believe this, but courtesy is contagious. It is as catching as the measles and a lot healthier. We all know what happens to one of us when we try to make a left turn at an intersection. It seems like a fellow a block up the street starts stepping on the gas to make sure we don't make the left turn. On your way home tonight, try letting the other fellow make the turn. He'll be surprised, then he'll smile wave his hand, call out, thank you, and go on his way grinning from ear to ear. I've seen it happen that that same fellow will feel so good that he'll pass the same courtesy on to some other fellow in the next few minutes. Because just as rudeness begets rudeness, so courtesy in a community is contagious. In fact, one of the alumni of this court and you'll all be alumni too as soon as you've paid your fine, has had several thousands of these safety stickers made up. Each of you will get one along with your receipt. And I'm asking you to place this on your car so that you'll be reminded the next time you have an urge to steal from your fellow driver. The session is adjourned.
the judge often says, if people would only be as courteous to each other on the highway as they are on a sidewalk, the traffic problem would soon disappear. But this courtesy is contagious theory of his sounds fine, but I don't know. Nellie, sure, she's naturally nice people. But I'll believe in his theory when I see one of those stickers on the grabber's car, or Arthur's. You see? If courtesy is so contagious, why doesn't one of these drivers catch the germ and let our Nellie out into the street? Okay, but it's no proof. Truck drivers are trained that way. Let's wait and see if it works on Nellie. No, this isn't a fair test. Nellie never stops for a left turner. She's afraid she'll stall. Well, what do you know? The truck driver's courtesy was contagious. But what about the left turner? Lefty didn't hear the judge's talk. The courtesy germ is strictly on its own with him. But it's still spreading. Truck driver to Nellie to Lefty to... Oh, no. Not the grabber. Oh, well, it was a nice epidemic while it lasted. <laughs> Too bad the grabber had to come along and break the chain when it was just getting a good start, because our unrepentant hero is swiftly approaching a situation where he really could use a break. Another road louse bites the dust. As I said earlier when we first got together, Arthur Average isn't anything like you. He couldn't be. His driving had faults which needed reforming. He'd never experienced the warm glow that you get from passing courtesy on to other drivers. He'd never known the pleasure that you find in your easy, relaxed, take-things-as-they-come way of driving. And until this moment, he hadn't ever realized the blessed peacefulness which flows from virtue rewarded. But now he knows. And from now on, his driving will be as common sensible and relaxed and smooth and safe and courteous, as downright pleasant, as yours has always been if you know what I mean. 